proclaiming charity. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. The Simple Truth, rising up to explore the difficult topics of real life. Join us as we proclaim the good, the true, and the beautiful with the simple truth of Jesus Christ and His Holy Catholic Church through Scripture, Tradition, and the Catechism. And now, your host, Jim Higgins. It's great to be back with you on The Simple Truth, where we proclaim the life-giving reality of Jesus and His Catholic Church. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Pure Strong Heart of St. Joseph. It is Current Events Wednesday, and our guest today is Dr. Carrie Gress, author of The Anti-Mary Exposed, Rescuing the Culture from Toxic Femininity. Before we bring Dr. Gress in, quick news item from today. It was reported this morning that YouTube permanently deleted the LifeSite News channel on YouTube, which had over 300,000 followers. The Station of the Cross, the Catholic media network that produces this show, also received word this morning from YouTube that we have been suspended for, from posting any videos or live streams to YouTube for one week due to speech that YouTube deemed to be misinformation um, that was apparently aired Monday on another network program, Mother Miriam Live. So for the next week, you can find live streaming video of this show, The Simple Truth, on my YouTube channel, Jim Havens, and you can always find our live stream on the Simple Truth Facebook page and the Station of the Cross Facebook page and also the Station of the Cross Rumble page. Rumble is another up and coming video platform, so you can find us um, in all of those places. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a great opportunity to really push back when th- these things happen and to make sure that you are subscribed with every way that you can um, help, help uh, put more, more promotion towards what we're doing. Obviously, as we're proclaiming the, the truth of Jesus and his Catholic Church and it becomes more and more of a threat to the advancing agendas of the dictatorship of relativism, we can expect more conflict coming our way in the form of big tech censorship. Uh, So we want to learn how to best navigate all of this and make the most of it as an opportunity. And it seems that um, just using it as a as a way to say, okay, well, let's support um, all of these good things that seem to be um, facing all of this um, suppression at this point. It seems to be a good way to push back is to support it all the more. And our guest today is a great example of how to do just that. Dr. Gress, thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So your book, The Anti-Mary Exposed, Rescuing the Culture from Toxic Femininity, recently experienced some big tech censorship. It seems to me that perhaps better than anyone I've seen, you have done a terrific job of flipping the attempted suppression into an opportunity to promote your book in a big way. What is your (laughs) view of what big tech is up to right now? And how have you made the most of the opportunity in response to the attempted Mm -hmm. suppression of your book? Yeah. Well, I mean, I can say all of it has been sort of un- unwitting. You know, I haven't, I didn't intend to sort of fight this back with any kind of valiant effort. I just am not that strategic of a thinker. So I think that there's definitely a lot of Holy Spirit going on here. But um, the book st- was actually banned from Facebook Marketplace and uh, Instagram Marketplace was the initial issue. Um, and there was some letter, you know, to the um, the gift shop Guadalupe Gifts in Florida that was actually trying to to post it, and there was some note that said that it, it was violating their policies. And um, so, anyway, they they attempted to appeal it, and eventually, they I don't think they ever heard from Facebook. They were just able to actually readmit it to their store. Um, but in the meantime, the, people just were angry when they heard about this and saw this. This was the you know four days or five days after. Biden's inauguration, and it just seemed like, um, you know, people wanted a way to, to respond to this. And of course, you know, banned book, a banned Catholic book was a great way to do that. So people were, were amazing and just bought it. They, you know, completely sold out um, both on Amazon and my publisher and my site and elsewhere. Um, but what ha- was strange was then Amazon actually, you know, how when an Amazon book goes out of stock, usually the buttons are there where you can say, you know, say temporarily out of stock, it will ship, you know, March X, Y, and Z or whenever mm-hmm. it's supposed to ship. They'll give you that information. Well, they actually took those buttons off. So you couldn't, in fact, keep purchasing it. You could only buy it through a, th- a third party seller. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, my, of course, my publisher kept trying to reach out to them and say, what's going on? And 
they would reinstate it for like an hour and then they would take it down again. So hmm. anyway, you know, it could be, it could have been a glitch. Um, but I think all, you know, all of these things together, it was really eye raising, eyebrow raising because, um, you know, it's a two year old book. It's, this is not a new book, brand new book. This is not brand new content. Um, and yet somehow it was being, you know, strange things were happening to it. Um, but the biggest reality was that, it, you know, I just started talking about why it was, it, it could have been targeted. Um, mm-hmm. and much of it has to do, of course, with the subtitle, um, talking about this idea of toxic femininity is pretty, um, you know, it's, it, you're not supposed to talk about that in our culture. Mm-hmm. Um, men are the ones that are at fault for just about everything. Um, and so I, I think that that had a lot to, to do with, um, the current situation. And so it's been a, a great opportunity to really talk about this book and how, even in the book, I explain, you know, this is kind of the playbook of how, um, the culture has been so decimated and destroyed. And much of that is because the, um, list group that of elite women that I have called the matriarchy, um, and the men that, that work with them are really trying to silence um, certainly women like me, but you can also see it throughout the culture. Anyone that disagrees with them um, is silenced or, or sidelined or, um, you know, they find some way to, to minimize their opinion. Um, so I, I think that that's been kind of the ironic part about it is just to see, you know, this book is the playbook for how they're dr- destroying the culture and that they're using these those seemingly exact same tactics um, to, mm-hmm. to silence this book as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, terrific. So we're going to use the opportunity today to help expose that playbook and uh, mm-hmm. and also proclaim the reverse playbook, the good news um, that that we really uh, need to hear and understand um, and to live. So, um, but first, where where is the best place for people to find your book right now? Um, would it be at the publisher's mm-hmm. website, Tan Books? Yeah, Tan Books is a great place to get it. Um, they have free shipping on orders over ten dollars, and um, that they have copies on hand. So that's that's the best place um, to find. If people want signed copies, they can go to my website at theologyofhome.com uh, um, as, as an alternative if you want to get it signed Great. for your daughter, or sister, or brother, or whomever. I'm happy to do that. Okay, terrific. Um, okay, so getting into, um, I guess, the playbook um, that is the bad mm-hmm. news, right, of what has gone yeah. wrong over the past um, 50, 60 years. Um, you say in the book that, that um, there are important points that everyone ought to know here about the mm-hmm. battle lines that were drawn in the 60s that form the backdrop of how many women think about themselves today. What do you think would be um, some of the best to make sure that we get out right now on the most important points mm-hmm. that people ought to know about what was done mm-hmm. back then? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the most important thing is to just recognize how much we have been manipulated, both by um, by an ideology that's a combination of two different things. So part of it, um, what was going on the, the 1960s and, and 70s, was really um, women who, who were openly, um, although people probably didn't realize it, openly using a lot of Marxist thought and Marxist ideology. Um, and they were also blending it with a lot of the occult. Um, and, you know, I've, I've come to see, <laughs> pretty easy to see, anytime Christianity and Judaism are weak, um, the occult just fills in. It's like the jungle, you know, the weeds just come in and that's what fills the gaps. Um, so we can see this, you know, I call it a, a, a deadly cocktail, really, of these two elements, the occult and Marxism, um, that have just formed the backbone of what radical feminism has fed us in the 1970s and still continues to feed us. So um, what's what's interesting, too, is just to even see how effective their arguments have been that they haven't actually had to change their footing or uh, their their talking points very much. You can still see Hollywood, you know, when there was all this issue about, you know, states like Georgia um, and Alabama and others sort of pushing back on abortion, um, the, the, the big issue was always, you know, it would come back to um, woman's choice and, you know, the same exact rhetoric um, without any real recognition that the science has changed since the 1970s, that women do regret their abortions, that there are um, people that would have made a different choice if they had been better informed. Um, so anyway, it, it's just interesting to see this pattern that, you know, you've got these starlets in Hollywood who are making the exact same arguments their mothers and grandmothers made, um, you know, decades ago. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's when you start seeing it, in fact, a good friend of mine, when I, when the book first came out said, you know, when you see the anti-Mary, you can't unsee it. Um, so yeah, I think that's, it's just a prevalent piece that when you start 
looking at how they've manipulated the culture, it's it's very evident. Mm-hmm. Help us to see that anti Mary that defines toxic mm-hmm. femininity. How how can we see this image of the anti Mary? What do we look for? Yeah. What do we see? Well, the, the, what jumped out at me, and this the whole idea came um, to me when I was I was writing my book called The Marian Option, and I was looking at how the, just the manifold ways Our Lady has influenced culture and helped Christians and you know save civilizations. Um, you know, certainly Our Lady of Guadalupe is this profound example of it in terms of the number of people that that came into the church from that somewhere between four and ten million people. Um, but uh, the the bigger thing is just just really see that the culture hasn't just kind of listed a little bit to the to the left. It hasn't just kind of moved slightly away from whom Our Lady is, but it's actually very it's diametrically opposed to who she is. Um, and we can see this certainly. The life issue is the easiest way to see it. Um, but you also have this distortion of womanhood, and and it, we see it now more than ever. Um, kind of this erasing of womanhood and much of that has to do with the, this idea the inception of it where women were were believed to be inferior to men and they had to become like men in order to become happy um, so that's the real seed of the of the problem mm-hmm. yes yeah, very good uh, when we get back from the break we're gonna we're gonna del- delve into this quite a bit more and um, really when we're listening to dr. Gress here one thing that jumps out to me, when she talks about being diametrically opposed, I do think back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where we hear, I will put enmity between you and the woman, talking about Satan, that uh, that ancient foe who, who is real and is with us, and uh, um, that complete and total opposition. And so we're going to get into that when we get back. What are the demonic influences here, the demonic underpinnings of all of this? And um, and we're going to look at Mary as well and see the beauty that that, uh, that we are called to and specifically that authentic femininity. We're, we'll be right back on The Simple Truth. This is Franciscan Media's Saint of the Day for February 10th. Today we celebrate Saint Scholastica. Twin Scholastica and her brother Benedict were born in Italy in 480. Little is known of their early life, though we do know that brother and sister were separated when Benedict left home to study in Rome. Years later, when Benedict established a monastery at Monte Cassino, Scholastica used his rule to found a religious community for women five miles away. The two visited each other annually. Because women were not permitted inside the monastery, a nearby farmhouse became their meeting place. There, brother and sister would spend hours praying and discussing spiritual matters. Around the year 542, they had their final meeting. Sensing her death was close at hand, Scholastica begged Benedict to stay with her until the next day. He protested that he couldn't spend a night outside the monastery without violating his community's rules. But a severe thunderstorm broke out and prevented him from leaving. Scholastica considered it God's answer to her prayer. Brother and sister parted the next morning. Three days later, Scholastica died. She was buried in the tomb Benedict had prepared for himself. There's more about the saints along with inspiration and Catholic resources at our website, saintoftheday.org. From Franciscan Media, this has been Saint of the Day. Hello, this is Father Frank Pavone of Priests for Life. Doing pro-life work is not simply a response to a cause or a movement, an ideology or a political platform. It's a vocation and a spirituality which shapes our pro-life activity and keeps us rooted in God amidst that activity. Learn more about this pro-life spirituality and how you can make a public commitment to live it at priestsforlife.org. This is Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life. Back to the simple truth. We are blessed today to have Dr. Carrie Gress with us. She is the author of a fantastic book that is out there right now. That is, um, it's exposing toxic femininity, and it is 
Um, it is giving us the antidote, right? It's called the anti-Mary exposed rescuing the culture from toxic femininity. It's getting a bit of a resurgence right now, published in 2019. And this is a message that, um, that yeah, I'm, I'm so glad it is getting a resurgence and that it does seem that the Holy Spirit is guiding that uh, very well. I do wanna encourage people to go to, um, to go get that book wherever they can find it. Tan Books is, is one place where you can go. And, and another place is also, is it theologyofhome.com? Is that right, Dr. Gress? That's right, yep. Okay, terrific. Now, um, where we left off, I wanted to jump in here. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says this in paragraph 391. It, said be, it says, behind the disobedient choice of our first parents lurks a seductive voice opposed to God, which makes them fall into death out of envy. Scripture and the church's tradition see in this being a fallen angel called Satan or the devil. The church teaches that Satan was at first a good angel made by God, the devil and the other demons were indeed created naturally good by God, but they became evil by their own doing. But this is um, the, the original enemy that continues um, to, to come after the, the children of, of light, the, the children of God that we are called to be by nature of our baptism, to be brought into union with Jesus, to share the very life of God, that Jesus would make us sons and daughters in him of the Father by the Holy Spirit. This is the glory to which we are made, but we do have an enemy um, that doesn't want us to freely make use of, of this gift of free will we've been given to receive the love of God and to love him back and to live our life accordingly. Um, how are the demonic underpinnings um, of this toxic femininity, as you call it, which is a, a great way to, to think of it, especially since the, the popularized phrase toxic masculinity. Um, how do you look at how do you look at the, the, the demonic in this and how um, how he's really ultimately the one that is behind all of this? Yeah, well, I think part of it starts with it, just the recognizing the reality that what, what's happened. Um, the, the family's pretty much been decimated. Um, women themselves are incredibly unhappy. I, I think this is one of those details that gets, you know, shoved under the rug quite a bit, um, where the narratives is supposed to be that, you know, women are getting happier and more opportunity and this is helping them and, you know, all of that. And yet, if you look at, you know, what I call the happiness metrics, um, things like suicide rates and divorce rates, STD rates, um, depression, uh, substance abuse, all of these things are, are pointing to some incredibly unhappy women in our culture. Um, so I, I think that that's certainly the fruit of it, but it does go back to, again, like I was saying, um, sort of this Marxist, um, uh, occultish kind of blend. And, you know, at the heart of that was really this effort to, um, to destroy the family, but to do that through, uh, sexual license, uh, you know, by promoting homosexuality, um, promoting abortion, promoting prostitution, all of these kinds of things that, that um, I, I talk about in the book. Kate Millett is one of the women that was very, a huge proponent of, of um, liberalizing all of these things and um, had a group of women that she would re repeatedly uh, say this litany of sorts that included a, a desire to see all of those things happen in the culture. And so it's interesting to think back in the 70s how these women, you know, are promoting this kind of thing because all of these things were really not part of the cultural culture at all. And yet now they're very much part of the, the, the fabric of our culture. Um, so it's, it's amazing to see just how incredibly successful they have been. Um, but you can also see the demonic elements. Uh, you know, one of the, the chapters that I go into extensively is I talk about um, this, this demon named Lilith. Um, and I, I, you know, the, when I first started researching this book, I thought, I hope I find enough information, you know, to make my argument. And uh, sp I spent two years researching it, and I, I certainly found plenty. And I was so grateful when I was I was done with it because there was just so much, and it was so depressing and awful. Um, but the the Lilith character was one that really caught my eye because I I knew had heard of the Lilith Fair, which um, Sarah okay. McLaughlin had gathered a bunch of female musicians for this festi music festival a couple of years in a row. And then um, there was this Lilith Fund that was set up in Houston after the terrible um, hur hurricane went through there um, that was for women that were supposed to, wanted to get a free abortion. Um, and so it's also very prevalent in feminist literature, this idea of Lilith. And I thought, well, what what's Lilith? Um, so when I looked into it, 
basically Lilith is this old, uh, older than our own scriptures kind of story um, that goes back to ancient Egypt and whatnot. Um, she's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, um, but it's ba basically when you, if you wanted to understand what she does, she seduces men and she kills babies. Um, that was a, the, the, the quickest description I found mm -hmm. of her. And even the word lullaby comes from people praying against Lilith to protect their children and their families. Um, James Joyce called her the, the patron saint of abortion. She's painted in Michelangelo's work. She's um, There's stories about her. Um, George MacDonald wrote them, and, and the, the author of Fiddler on the Roof wrote a story about her. So um, it's definitely a character that's come up over and over again. Um, and yet she is really considered to sort of be this this woman that fought the patriarchy um she was considered to be the the wife of adam and fought fought adam um wouldn't be submissive to him and so that's why she's heralded um and yet that you know i've talked to an exorcist about her and um she's very much has a role um in, in uh, demonic possession and whatnot so anyway all of this is sort of swirling around in um in radical feminism and and i think women just have no idea what, what they're getting themselves into. And so as a result, we see it, Wicca right now has actually more adherence than there are Presbyterians. Um, so it's very much growing and um, becoming something that's very popular. And again, because women don't have the right kind of faith formation, they're falling into it very, very easily because it's been made to look attractive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's amazing too that uh, the, the lies behind all of this, mm. um, yeah. that they that they're not more easily seen when you look at how mm -hmm. evident it ought, ought to be when you do look at the symptoms of what's going yeah. on. I mean, abortion is a, is a very good example. This lie of abortion, which has killed now almost 62 million um, preborn mm -hmm. children. I mean, who, who knows? Countless mm -hmm. amounts with abortifacients and everything else. But when, when right. we think about this lie, I mean, it, it, it flips... Yeah. Uh, femininity, it flips womanhood, it flips motherhood into the exact mm -hmm. opposite where it, it's deceived women into thinking that if they're going through challenges when they're pregnant, that the problem is the child so much so that kill the child and you're going to get rid of the problem. And we know that's just a lie. We know that it is not true. It, it is exploiting, it's gravely exploiting pregnant moms in need for profit. And when you spend time on the front lines in pro-life work, you find out very quickly that these moms are truly being deceived in, in many ways where they, they, they just, they actually want to love their, their children, but they're being told this lie and they're believing it and they're being deceived by it when their hearts are truly naturally made to love that child. And, and we do, you know, as we try to explain um, to these moms, when we meet them in their, their hour of need on the sidewalks, as we're ministering to them outside of abortion centers, we will say, look, we try to, that's the number one thing we're trying to do is to help them to see their child as a human being worthy of love and that their problems, let's identify what the problems really are. It's not the child. And then let's actually work on what those problems are. Otherwise, you're going to go into this, you're going to buy the lie, the child is going to be killed and you're going to have greater problems and all the other problems you had on top of it as well. So it's such a clear lie, but it's so baked into our culture, even our medical establishment, our education system, our media, everything. Um, and now we've got the, the, the so-called transgenderism in sports where it ought to be, it's so cartoonish almost in, in being so outlandish. How are people not seeing these symptoms and waking up that there is a, a big lie at the heart of all this? Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And it's it's interesting to look at the ideology there and see that the, those foundational lies are certainly that our, our children are an obstacle to our happiness and our husbands are an obstacle to our happiness. And even any claim that we have to being feminine is actually an obstacle to our happiness. I mean, even it's interesting to look at um, what these women were trying to get at. And there, it really was this sort of enshrinement of femininity that they that they wanted to get. And um, Gloria Steinem just published a book when she turned 80 a couple of years ago. And she said, you know, she finally got to this point where she was genderless. And that's what she had, you know, was striving for her whole life. So... Mm -hmm. The, the radical feminist movement has actually just been the bedrock and the foundation for what we're seeing with LGTB movement. It's just the exact same ideology. The, the, the amazing thing, of course, though, is that it's sort of, um, for women that didn't realize where it was leading them, it's been shocking to them to see what it's doing to women's sports and what it's actually doing to, 
to womanhood, but it's it's all of the same cloth um, in terms of that. You know, the core piece is we want to let help people, or we want people to believe that they can change their human nature. Um, and of course, we know that 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 doesn't happen. You don't change uh, all that deep seated DNA and all that cellular level content that that tells the body if it's male or female and those things can't be wiped out hips and elbows and you know adam's apples all those things don't go away um so it's an amazingly you're right it's there's there's just this pack of lies that have been packaged so well um and unfortunately i think as the church we haven't done enough to to push back on it i think Mm -hmm. um we spent an awful lot of time making amazing arguments and we have a lot of really great ones um, but we d- we haven't found a way to present them back into the culture with the effectiveness that that they've used, and this is why we sort of have this sense that you know every other person must be LGTB, um, and it, without recognizing that you know twenty five twenty to twenty five percent of the the, the culture is or of the population is actually Catholic, um, and it's about three percent two to three percent that's actually LGTB um, because their voices are so loud and they've done such an amazing job of making it a trendy hip. Um, point you know to be involved in at this this point in culture Mm -hmm. yeah i want to drill down on that in in just a moment but first i do want to recommend also for people if they aren't aware of this this book by sue ellen browder subverted um a very good um, testimonial book where she really is a whistleblower of what happened in in the the so-called sexual revolution and the women's movement that the the um the tagline on, on this book is how I helped the sexual revolution hijack the women's movement. And she goes down um, in her explanation there of how she used to work for Cosmo magazine. She was this Cosmo girl and she was basically selling lies. She admits to it and says that she would make up stories is what they would have her do. She'd make up stories about how it was so liberating to live in this sexually licentious way and, and talk about just make up stories about women who were involved in all sorts of these grave sins and acting like the fruits of it were good and she would pass it off as if it was nonfiction and they were all made up stories. And so we, we also, we know this, we, we can see this in the media in, in many movies and shows as well, characters sin and then we see that the fruits are good, right? This is fiction, right? The, the truth is, is that when we sin, there are negative consequences to it. And so we need to really look at what the truth is and and, and to expose those lies for what they are. Dr. Gress's um, book it does a great job at that. I do want to get into the good news um, of femininity, of authentic femininity, and look at that perfect model, Mary, as well when we get back. And um, also, I think this is um, going to intrigue some people. I want to pick Dr. Gress's brain as soon as we get back first, though, on just the question she answers. Um, she, she makes this point in, in some of her writings about how it's not just enough just to try to um, battle within this world of, fe- of feminism, but also to um, to actually just present the truth we have on its own, the, the Catholic truth, right? The truth that we have, not to try to actually package it and, and try to sell it to, to feminists in this certain way, but just to share with them the good news that we, that we have. So she'll say it more eloquent than that and explain what it all means when we get back on The Simple Truth. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Jesu, ufam Tobie. Jesus, I trust in you. This is Rick Paolini and Father Jacek Mazur. Mercy is the form that God's love takes when it overflows his divine life and pours out upon his creatures. It's a great message for Lent, but also for any time of the year. It's a message of hope. Tune in for Divine Mercy in My Soul, who will be delving into the diary of St. Maria Faustina every Sunday morning at 11. And catch the Encore presentation every Tuesday evening at 8. Here at the Station of the Cross, we proudly bring the truths of the Catholic faith to countless listeners through radio and mobile devices, and we're grateful for the feedback we've received. I grew up Catholic Church, haven't been in the Catholic Church for decades, but I'm in the process of working my way back for the simple reason that I needed a place to listen to pro-life, pro-family messages. Catholic radio is it. It's a place to hear that message without all the political bias and all that that's going on on News Talk Radio. It changed my life. It's the only station. 
or not. The Catholic station is an answer to prayer. It, it couldn't be more fulfilling. It's helped me learn more about the faith, and it's helped me to deepen my faith as a result of that. It's on continuously in my house, day and night. You can't imagine how much I receive from that channel. If you've been blessed by listening to the Station of the Cross, let us know. Call 1-877-888-6279, extension 112. Then share your testimonial with us. Oftentimes, it is easy to think that we are facing an upward battle when it comes to fighting abortion. But our Lord reminds us that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Your faithful dedication will help us make abortion unthinkable in this country. Human life is sacred. Think about it. Coalitionforlife.com Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here. Our guest today is Dr. Carrie Gress, author of The Anti-Mary Exposed, Rescuing the Culture from Toxic Femininity. You can find that book at tanbooks.com. You can also go to the website theologyofhome.com, and you can also get an autographed copy of the book there. Now, Dr. Gress, you also have um, articles on your website at carriegress.com, and one of those articles makes this point. It says this, what is curious, however, is that many Catholics are unafraid to try to engage radical feminism on its own turf by trying to reinvent a feminism that can satisfy even the most dogged or secular feminists, while contributions have been made about the essence of womanhood, these many efforts have resulted in the splintering of feminism into so many camps that few can keep track of them all. End of quote. Unpack that a little bit more for us. I mean, people people can say feminism and mean a million different things by it. How should we be looking at the word feminism and how to even talk about it and to present the truth um, within that framework or to that framework? Right. Well, the first thing I want to mention, actually, going back to your comments before the, the segment, um, I actually interviewed Sue Ellen Browder for my book. Mm. And when she was inventing those stories for Cosmo, she said there were two things that the Cosmo girl could not be. She could not be a virgin and she could not be a mother. Um, so it was fascinating, of course, because Our Lady is, of course, the virgin mother. Um, mm. You know, these are the, the natural ways through which women sanctify themselves. And so that's why the, the real attack is on, on both of those those elements. Um, but yes, I think all of this goes um, bleeds very easily into the question of, well, what do we do about feminism? Um, and I think that there's this really deep desire in women um, to reach out to other women, to try and find some common ground and sort of fe- feel like there's a way to say, we, you know, we're in this together, even though we disagree on these various points. And that's, uh, you know, what a lot of um, people that call themselves Catholic feminists have done. Um, and I, I have a lot of respect for a lot of these people that have 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 written in that in that vein. Um, but I think that it, it really does become problematic because, of course, like you said, there's so many different definitions of feminism now, and it just it's been drained of all of its um, real meaning. I mean, it could mean pro woman, but what I mean by pro woman and you mean and you know what Gloria Steinem means by pro woman are very very different things. Um, so I think that that's the big challenge is when you don't have a common ground to really even talk about something in a way that people understand, it's very hard to build on that. Um, the other problem too, I think, is that it, it also automatically sort of separates out women away from the family, away from their children, away from their husbands. It sort of um, puts them in this victimhood status. Um, but then there's this, this natural barrier or, or struggle that's, that ensues sort of uh, between the sexes and between the generations that I think is, is also problematic. Um, but the, the bigger point, too, is even just to recognize what the church has taught about women. I, I mean, it, it's sort of ironic that, that um, radical feminism is so against the church in light of the fact that it's, it's from Jesus and it's from devotion to Mary but that's really the, where the development of this this idea that women have equal dignity to men came from. Um, so to try and you know sweep them out of the, any kind of discussion, um, you know, it's just kind of absurd because it didn't come from secularism. It didn't come from um, you know any other world religion. Um, 
but the, the the church you know obviously we have so many people that you know we're all sinners we people have lived it imperfectly um lived out their relationship to from between men and women um but but the church has always done an amazing job of helping us understand the value of women and the value of men and the value of the family as an intact unit um so that there there isn't a need for something called feminism to actually inform the intellectual tradition the tradition is very long um, it's very involved. It's been very much um, uh, influenced by great saintly women and men. Um, and we see when people are actually striving towards holiness, these these elements melt away and love sort of permeates these relationships um, versus the the constant emphasis and and look at what you know what where's the drama in these relationships. So anyway, I, I just think it's I've moved away from the word as in terms of using it myself because I just think that there's so many problems with it that it's not um, helping. And you know it doesn't even make sense actually to sort of go down that vein. I mean you wouldn't try and say, I'm going to be a neo-Nazi or a different kind of Nazi so that I can convince the Nazis not to be Nazis. Um, you know, so you might think that that's kind of an extreme example. Um, you could say the same thing about the mafia or communists, um, mm -hmm. but we don't ar try and argue people out of things that way. Um, but I think the difference is, of course, that, well, the, the big difference is, of course, actually, if you look at feminism, it's actually been a lot more deadly than these other ideologies. It's just been very... Um, kind of white gloved um, in terms of its deadliness. Um, but the, it's it's motivated, I think, again, it goes back to this idea that women want to be able to find a place where they can relate to other women. And radical feminism has also done an amazing job of making those of us who don't agree with it look like we're doormats. Um, so it's that desire to sort of say, no, we're not doormats. We agree with you on all, a lot of these things. Um, but I just think it's it, it raises a lot more problems than can be solved by, by going down that that avenue of embracing an ideology. Right, right. Yeah, we can almost be um, too clever for our, our own good in a certain way there when we have the treasure, right? Jesus has revealed this to us. The church has handed it down to us for 2,000 years, authentically transmitting it to us. Um, yeah, we've got the wealth of great saints, St. Saint John Paul the Great, what he has written um, about women to, to help us to um, really see the, the feminine genius and to understand it. And do, I, wish, I wish he's written as much about men, quite frankly, to, to help men to understand masculinity, authentic masculinity. Um, but let me just give you an opportunity here just to proclaim the good news. Uh, your, your book, certainly flushes it out in, in a very full, much fuller way, obviously, than what we have time for here. But as far as what is essential um, to you and, and to share right now for, um, for men and women listening, um, how, how do you proclaim the truth that we need to hear about authentic femininity? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because this writing the, the book Anti-Mary actually is what has led to my next two books, um, Theology of Home 1 and Theology of Home 2. Hmm. Um, those were books were really a, a, a positive or maybe um, a way of going on offense. I think as, as Catholics, we spend a lot of time playing defense and mm -hmm. um, trying to protect the truth, but we don't actually take our own story and present it to people in a beautiful and compelling way um, because we do have an amazing story. Um, and that's what I did with these next two books with my co-author, Noel Maring, um, is it's a, it, the, our books are like coffee table books. and. Um, they have gorgeous images. You know, we, we joke about how the images are all those pictures you're not really supposed to see in culture anymore. You know, we've got dads who look very competent and we have lots of kids and we've got pregnant women and, you know, all of these people look happy and healthy instead of, um, you know, cowering in their doormat hood or whatever you want, want to describe it as in the culture. Um, so I think that, that that's been probably the, the biggest fruit in, in my life and is has been... I have a PhD in philosophy, and I thought if I just I can I can argue people into believing this and understanding this, and I don't can't tell you how many times that just didn't work for me, um, and so it, it's been this lifelong journey of just begging God, how do I reach women? And so I saw how how has the culture been destroyed? You know, these women weren't reading Marx, they weren't reading Margaret Sanger, they weren't reading anything intellectual, but they were reading Cosmo. They were reading, you know, Vogue and all of these different kinds of things that really attract women. Um, you know, magazines, women love magazines, um, and they've been virtually taken over by, by secularists. So it, my 
idea is really we can reach out to women with our own story, telling using our own images, using our own language. Um, so it's been fun because especially theology of home, you know, who who doesn't love talking about homes? I, I, I'm amazed at how many conversations I've had that have been struck up with people that don't have any faith, um, but they're kind of intrigued by the book because of the angle that it takes where I'm, I'm explaining not not how to, de to decorate your home, but why we didn't want to decorate our homes. Um, and it's, of course, a foreshadowing of, of heaven. That's what we want. Um, so anyway, I think that this is this is a real challenge that we that we all have is to sort of see how do we talk about women in this way that's beautiful and compelling instead of just always kind of defending ourselves? Um, how do we put it out there to help people get off this freeway, so to speak, that we're on um, culturally where we, we don't really have options to help them understand that there's a different way to think? Mm -hmm. um, so I've been digging a lot also into um, just what it means to be a woman and kind of describing that and coming up with kind of a new language and grammar for women to wrap their minds around because we spent so much time talking about how we are, how we relate to men, but we don't have enough about what's fundamentally feminine and beautiful and in a, in a compelling way. Mm -hmm. but, you know, that's great. And, and so folks can go to theologyofhome.com. I see them both there, Theology of Home a book, Theology of Home 2, The Spiritual Art of Homemaking. Um, before we hit our next break, can you take some time just to share with us, um, just to point us to our Blessed Mother and share some of the beauty and goodness of our Blessed Mother with us? Yeah, well, I think this is is really the key, is that she is this model. And I think there's so many uh, desires that women have in their in their hearts naturally. But, um, you know, we sort of feel like, how do I relate to Mary? She was sinless and, uh, you know, she was, this is a long time ago. Like, she feels very saccharine and one-dimensional. So in the second half of the, the Anti-Mary Exposed, I really go into how we can relate to her on these levels of, of desire that we have. The first one, of course, is that we want to be known and loved. Um, and Our Lady exemplifies that in terms of just doing God's will and knowing God is her Father. And so she has this freedom and this joy and this deep love um, that comes through that, um, that, that that I think we can relate to. And certainly I go into it much more deeply in the book. Um, the second one is that we all want to do good. And you can see this even among people who have, have a very distorted idea of the good is they're still trying, you know, social justice warriors and all of this. People are trying to help other people. They just have a, a very distorted way of how that works. Um, and this is, again, where Our Lady, you know, everything that she has and is comes through God's will. Um, and so this is why she has the capacity to do good and to, to be good. Um, the closer that we mimic her, the more readily we're going to be able to mimic that. And it, it's the same pattern, of course, with the third desire of every woman's heart, and that's to be beautiful. Um, you know, this is one of those that's that's hard to say out loud because um, it seems vain or it seems like it's a, such a disordered desire. Um, or people have just shoved it down deeply and don't think that it applies to them. But I think if you look at who Our Lady is, she... Um, you know, in every description of every apparition I've ever read, the, the person who saw her said, you know, she's the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. Um, and that the beauty that she has is not an accident. The beauty that women have is also not an accident. God has given that to us so that we can draw others to him, um, to his His beauty, that we're meant to, to embody that. So that's you can see why that's such an amazing the awful thing that's happening to these trans girls, you know, these girls that are, are undergoing um, surgeries and taking hormones to sort of d to completely um, mutilate their bodies um, is to mm -hmm. take away that that beauty. Um, so anyway, I, I, it's I think it's one of those things that the more we come to know her, the more we realize that um, these desires that we have are are embodied in her in this perfect way, and uh, you know, all of it points us back to trying to find who. God the Father is and have this relationship with him so that we embody these things in our ourselves the way that she does in her in her life and body. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. You have another book entitled The Marian Option, God's Solution to a Civilization in Crisis. Can you give us a, a brief uh, synopsis of that book? Is that something uh, that is somewhat an answer or a complement um, to that popular book that was out for a time, The Benedict Option? Yeah, no, this book was in response to that. I actually mm -hmm. was doing some research and gave a talk on the Benedict Option and all the things that Rod Dreyer brought up that were problematic in culture and, and the world. 
um, you know, he proposed St. Benedict. And of course, I love St. Benedict, but, um, I, I, you know, with all due respect, Our Lady has done it better um, in terms of whether it's evangelization or um, dealing with Islam, dealing with um, atheism, dealing with famine, disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the book was really a bird's eye, or is it really a bird's eye look at the things that she's done throughout history. Um, and it was just this great, great project to jump into because she is, you know, the stories are amazing and they all weave together. And um, it's just incredible how much she has done to help Christians. And I think, um, you know, it was a book to encourage us to see that she really is with us and is wants to help us. We just have to ask. Terrific. Well, that's all there at Theology of Home. Dot com. When we do get back, um, I'm going to ask a, a little bit about something in an article that Dr. Grass wrote um, about the American patriarch and, and about really um, feminine, feminism's unexpected cure and, and to really get at the heart of, of what that is all about and, and to get at the, the true Um, the true nature of men, the natural authority of men, real men, and the need that we have in this culture for men to really step up and be who they are called to be. You're listening to The Simple Truth. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. At the Station of the Cross, we understand that life circumstances can affect your giving options, whether by moving or by switching banks and credit card numbers. Please let us know if recent changes have been made to your payment information so that we can better serve you as you continue to bless us with your financial support. Update your information today at thestationofthecross.com or by calling 1-877-888-6279, extension 104. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent from your diocese, our apostolate is listener supported. The Station of the Cross thanks our supporters who have enabled us to broadcast Catholic programs for more than 20 years. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel message and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. Thank you for your continued support and may God bless you and your family. Hi, this is Wayne Hepler, founder of the St. Thomas More House of Prayer. If you are looking for a way to grow closer to our Lord, I invite you to visit our Catholic retreat center dedicated to praying and promoting the Liturgy of the Hours. The rustic setting provides a quiet atmosphere for prayer and for learning about the public communal prayer of the Catholic Church known as the Liturgy of the Hours. The seven canonical hours are prayed throughout the day, beginning with the Office of Readings at 5.30 a.m. and ending with night prayer at 8 p.m. You are welcome to join in the prayer at any time or to book the house for a retreat. We are located at 365 Hill City Road in Cranberry, Pennsylvania. For more information or to book a visit, email info at liturgyofthehours.org or call the retreat house at 814-676-1910. You can also learn more by visiting liturgyofthehours.org. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with our guest today, Dr. Carrie Gress, author of The Anti-Mary Exposed, Rescuing the Culture from Toxic Femininity, uh, you can find that book at tanbooks.com, also the theology of home.com. Uh, Dr. Gress, on your website, carriegress.com, the one article that is there entitled Feminism's Unexpected Cure, it lists what you describe as a feminist manifesto of sorts from 50 years ago. You, you made mention of it earlier in the show. You also list it in the introduction of your book, The Anti-Mary. But in the article, you also list a new, a new litany which claims that the answer to restoring the culture and the family doesn't focus upon women at all, but starts with restoring what you say you deliberately called the American patriarch, by which you mean the natural authority of men, real men. You say the old litany, the the feminist manifesto, was effective because it started by destroying the authority of men. Finally, you say that in rewriting the litany, you realize that the restoration of manhood was required, and with it, what would follow was the restoring of the women, the family, the culture. Can you unpack this some for us? Yeah, no, I mean, this is was a really interesting reality that played out in my life. I, um, I knew about that litany that the feminist women had said, and at, at um, one point, 
really started thinking about how do I how do I get together a group of twelve women and kind of undo that that prayer litany or whatever it was that chant that that they um, had been reciting over and over again and um, you know never there was never really an opportunity for me to have twelve women together or to pull it together just just with you know kids and families and all of that so. Um, then last year I, I, my friends had a baby shower for me. I actually, um, had a baby and I had, I was old enough. I had already given away all my baby things. And then sure enough, I was pregnant at 46. And, um, so you know, my, my friends threw a shower for me and it was, it was amazing. It was a beautiful, incredible day. But as the shower is winding down, I realized that there were 12 women in the room. So I said, I asked them quickly, I said, would you all be willing to, to pray this prayer with me? And um, of course, everybody was just really excited about the possibility. And um, so we, we ended up doing that. And um, but as we I was rewriting it um, very quickly with my friend, I, I noticed just how much this this destruction of the culture that they have been effective in doing um, was based on the fact that they w- they we were really after the patriarch. That if you can get, knock the patriarch out, um, then you you get everything kind of. Um, and this is you can see this in the language too. Just still how how uh, you know blighted the, the the patriarchy is and what an awful word it is. Um, so I was I was fascinated by it because of course I've been fo- so focused on how do we cure women and help women and uh, you know I realized that the the, the very cornerstone really is men we've got we've got to help men understand this um so one of the things i've tried to do certainly is help diminish a lot of the angst and irritation that men often feel towards women because they don't realize how much of this is just manipulation and sort of programmed into us because of the culture um how do we diffuse that um but on the flip side we also obviously have to help women understand how they help the men in their lives be men and be have and use the authority that that god has given to them um, so I, I think that that's really at the heart of it is that, that recognizing um, that we have to let men be men. And um, there was a, a couple months ago, I was looking through this scripture commentary and I got, I was in Genesis and I was, I was reading about the natural order that God has set up, of course, with, you know, there's God, the father, and then there's um, Adam. And then out of his rib comes Eve, who's his, his helpmate. And then from that, they have dominion over the animals. Well, what happened with Eve, of course, was the exact opposite. You've got the animals. You've got the serpent who's telling Eve what to do. And then Eve tells Adam what to do. And then, of course, they're left without God. Um, so I think that this is exactly what, what we're seeing in the culture today is this, you know, the demon is, 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 is demons are feeding these ideas to women. And women have effectively silenced men by, by um, making the patriarchy such an evil thing. And so as a result, we have this, this godless upside down culture that that we're currently living in mm-hmm. yeah the catechism of the catholic church 372 um, it says this man and woman were made for each other not that god left them half made or incomplete he created them to be a communion of persons in which each can be a helpmate to the other for they are equal as persons and complementary as masculine and feminine in marriage god unites them in such a way that by forming one flesh, they can transmit human life, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. By transmitting human life to their descendants, man and woman as spouses and parents cooperate in a unique way in the Creator's work. There it is, beautiful vision for who we truly are and to share the very life of God. The Catechism gets into that as well. Um, But, you know, all of this going back to the beginning here of 50, 60 years ago and this radical feminism and um, we get back to a perversion in sexual morality. A lot of that is encapsulated in um, in what we see with the birth control pill first entering into um, into culture. And so, um, you know, we're so far down the road from this distortion of um, the true image of man and woman and what marriage is truly meant to be and what sexuality is really meant to be. Um, sex within marriage, that's what it's for. And so we're so far, we're so far gone from this original um, and true vision of who we are. Um, not a, any tips for us to, to say, okay, well, this seems like a really overwhelming task to say, how do we, how do we restore all of this? Um, anything when you think about it, um, you know, how, how, you know, I guess any explanation, any tips, any encouragement for us to not be overwhelmed, not be discouraged, but be encouraged to, to go forward and do what we can. Right. 
No, I think that's a great question. And that's um, certainly the, the, the reason why I wrote that the marrying option um, is just to recognize how much Our Lady wants to help us. Um, and she doesn't want to just help us in this sort of generic way, but she wants to be involved in our lives and bring all of us to her son. And, you know, she knows what it cost her son to save us. So she's all the more interested in making sure that we can get get to him, that, it, that we show that it was worth doing, you know, that we don't squander that um, suffering that he went through. So um, I think that that's the beautiful thing, too, about recognizing Our Lady is that she wants us to do it in a very unique way. Um, certainly what I'm called to do is very different than what you're called to do and, and so on and so on with, you know, all Christians out there. Um, and yet, but she knows why God created us. So when we trust her between Mary and consecration and the rosary, um, those are just the most incredible tools that we have to be able to get to that point where our lives become meaningful and, and fruitful. Um, and it, it, I think that that's a vital piece. Um, the other thing is just even to, to recognize, um, you know, that there are, we are called to be fruitful and, and to live that out. And this is what was really the focus of my second book, um, Theology of Home too. Um, was to look at, you know, the fact that women aren't called to be powerful or in control um, or to manipulate others. We're called to be fruitful. And that, I think that's a beautiful, there's a beautiful way to, to talk about this. And of course, sometimes it, we just can't wrap our minds around it because we don't have the language for it. And that's really what we did in the, the second book was to try and help women understand what that means in a fresh way that feels compelling and, and applies to, to each of our lives. Um, but yeah, I think that there's that Our Lady offers us obviously this this model, um, and she offers us the, you know the, the prayers and the, the avenue to get to that. Um, but yeah, I think it certainly can become daunting. But um, you know we have this incredible church and all of these saints and you know models of the saints that that we can follow um, versus just getting so sucked up into the culture and and feeling you know, the weight of despair or feeling like there's, there's nothing we can do about it. I think mm -hmm. we're all here for a reason and, um, drawing close to our lady makes that reason clearer and clearer every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say the, the example of the fruitfulness of, of the books and, and the, uh, the other options that you have there at theology of home.com candles and, um, all kinds of home goods, things like that. People can check out theology of home.com. Um, it's a witness to us, right? There, there are steps we can take. Let's participate with God's grace and do that good that is before us. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Gress for being on with us today. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, and I do want to recommend one other title that I see here, and that is a book that we have, and I, I didn't realize that it was you that wrote it, Marian Consecration for Children, another great option there at TheologyofHome.com. Thank you for being with us today. We'll be back at it tomorrow on The Simple Truth at 4 p.m. Eastern. God bless you.